Ben Crotty. Uh, I'm one of the techs for GRT Avionics and Grand Rapids Technologies. Um, I deal mostly with the EFIS side of things, uh, with technical support issues, with installation and operation, things like that, with the EFISs. But I've been using the uh, Grand Rapids Technology EIS, the engine monitor, uh, since about 1992 when uh, Greg started with the company. The first airplane that my dad and I built back then was a Colt Twin Star Mark III, and uh, we put one of those in it and been using those things ever since on a lot of different airplanes. Uh, spent some time down in Tennessee, production manager for Jabber USA Sport Aircraft, and every single one of those airplanes had one of the EISs in it. So when I got into GRT Avionics working there, um, didn't really have much of a learning curve when I got there because I've done most of this stuff already. What I'm going to cover today is just the basic stuff on the installation of both the EIS and the EFIS. Most of the stuff is in, in the book. Not all of it is 100% clear, and the stuff that's not 100% clear is kind of what we're going to try and cover today. Uh, I know I won't get to all of it, and I know there's a lot of different variations to the installations that you can have, depending on which EIS you have, whether it's a 2000 or a 4000, 6000, whatever it might be, and what you're using for aux functions for fuel pressure, fuel level indicators, you name it, trim indicators, things like that. So like I said, Grand Rapids Technologies began back in 1991. Greg Tolman was the, is the inventor of the, uh, of the EIS. He was an ultralight flyer back in those days and wanted something better so that he would actually be able to pay attention to the outside world instead of having to look down at his EGTs and CHT gauges on his two-stroke in his Challenger and let him fly the plane instead of having to pay attention to the instrumentation. And that's why he, at the time, was working for uh, one of the aviation companies in Grand Rapids. And he's a electrical engineer by trade, so he was able to design the circuit boards and everything needed, software, everything else, and out came the EIS. As the years went on, the EIS evolved, and in 2004, he hooked up with Todd Stehauer, and the two of them created the Horizon 1 EFA system. Now we've got the Horizon 1, the HX, the Sport systems, and the HXRs. And the EIS is still there in that entire system. It's the collection point for the engine information and is able to send it all over to the EFA system so that you can display all that engine information. that I'm going to have in my airplane are going to be completely different than somebody else would in their airplane. I'll want fuel level from capacitive senders where somebody else will have float senders. So being able to configure all of those aux functions separately and make them work with each individual installation is part of the hard part for us as the techs because every system is different. for that system is that it takes a little bit more work to set it up, a little bit more thinking to set it up, but once it's done, you get to see what you want to see the way you want to see it, not the way that some other electrical engineer designed it, set it up, and said, this is what you get. If you want something else, that's too bad. This is how I did it. So you, the owner or builder, get to decide what you're going to be looking at. There's a quick list of some of the things that the EIS can measure. There's up to 30 different inputs on the EIS. You can have a maximum of six EGTs, six CHTs, oil temperature, oil pressure, the six aux functions that we were talking about that can be set up for anything from float level, manifold pressure, fuel pressure, temperatures, um, you name it. And then there's also carb temps, fuel flows, 
voltmeters, everything else, current sensors, stuff like that. Um, for pretty much every engine that's out there, anything from the smallest two-stroke, two like a, a Rotex 447, up to and including Walter turbine engines in uh, Lance Air Fours and things like that. So there's a very wide range of engines and parameters that people want to look at, and the system is able to be customized to all of those different setups. But well, with the thermocouples, the pressure sensors, and the flow transducers, the EIS is measuring either a change in voltage, a change in resistance, or a pulse count, depending on what, which one of the sensors that it is. And in those different voltage changes or resistance changes, we scale the aux functions um, to adjust the amount of the indication change for a particular resistance change, and then that gives you the number that makes sense on the EIS. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, the EIS also has a warning light input, so that with all that programming that you do at the beginning, you can set up maximums and minimums for temperatures and voltages and fuel flows and things like that, so that if something gets out of the parameter, the light will show up, just like you'd expect it to. But if the light is not on, then you know that everything that you've set in there is within the limits. So that allows you to pay attention to the outside world and actually fly the plane. And when you're flying something pretty simple like a Challenger, like what Greg was when he started the company, um, there's not a whole lot else to do in the plane other than either look at the gauges or fly the plane. So he was able to spend more time looking outside, flying the plane, and not worrying about what his engine was doing. The aux functions. There's six aux functions on an EIS 4000 or 6000. On the two-stroke versions, the 2000 has uh, 2000 and the 2004 stroke. They both have two. Um, with those, what you're doing is you're taking a resistance change or a voltage change and measuring that and there's two numbers that you have to set when you set those up. It's a scale factor and an offset. Well, the scale factor correlates the raw electrical readings to useful measurements. So in other words, if it sees a particular voltage change, say a one volt change on a capacitive float sender or a capacitive fuel sender, that one volt change will translate into a particular amount of fuel difference read by the sensor in the tank. And by adjusting the scale factor, it gives you a number that makes sense. So one volt doesn't necessarily mean one gallon. In an RV, one volt will mean, give or take, right around four gallons. But in a velocity, that one volt change for the same capacitive sender is going to mean change that it's measuring, whether it's a voltage or a resistance or, or the pulse count. Um, so as an example, as you're looking at the float sender type, if you're reading 450 ohms on your float sender and empty is 90, well, the scale factor isn't going to be one-to-one -one on that ohm change because you only have a 20-gallon tank. In, in a perfectly square tank, which makes it very easy, which very few of us have. Um, you know, the 450 to 90 ohm difference, it's a 360 ohm change from full to empty. Then divide that by the 20 gallons, so it's an 18 ohm change for every gallon of fuel that comes out of the tank. So as that changes, and this, you adjust the scale factor so that that 18 ohm change gives you an indication of one gallon difference in the fuel. The offset, which is the second number that you set for these aux functions, that effectively moves the zero range, the, the zero indication, to what the resistance value for the empty tank gives you. In the example that we, that we had, it was a 90 ohm reading with an empty tank. 
So the zero is actually at 90 ohms, whereas you'd think that you know, being 18 ohms per gallon, that would be five gallons in a tank. But because the empty is the 18, you move that scale, the offset, to change the range of where the zero indication is on the resistance range that it's reading. wiring, um, as, uh, as you can see there, that's the uh, third page from the back end of the EIS 4000 manual. All of our wire harnesses that we provide with the EIS units are all color coded. Every single one of the wires is a different color and they all correspond to the wiring diagram for whatever they're going to be used for. Obvious easy ones, you know, red's going to be power, black's going to be brown. And everything else has a little bit of a meaning to it, but um, wiring the thing up, the simple ones, oil temperature, oil pressure, um, the uh, carb temp, coolant temp, and outside air temperature, if you decide to hook those up, that offset and scale factor settings that you have that, that we were just talking about, those are strictly for the aux functions, because all of that stuff, for those sensors, the OET, the coolant temp, the carb temp, and the oil temp, and oil pressure, those are already preset and hardwired inside of the unit themselves. So that's just a simple one wire hookup. When you get into wiring the aux functions, which is uh, where we're going to kind of go into next, um, it gets a little bit more complicated because you're adding different parts, different wires together in order to get the readings that you need. Um, things like the fuel flow, that's a pretty easy one because there is the power for it coming out of pin number 13 top left hand corner there and then pin number 14 which is in the bottom right hand corner that's the white with green that's the sensor itself giving the pulse count for the fuel flow the red's the power and then there's a crown for it as well 